Welcome to China Unscripted. I'm Chris Chapel. I'm Shelley Zhang. And I'm Matt Ganesta. Well, the biggest and absolutely most important China story happening right now is that Gap had to apologize to China for T-shirts. T-shirts are critical. The next world war might be started over T-shirts. Matt, how about you tell us what happened? Gap released this T-shirt design, and it wasn't in the U.S. I believe it was just in some overseas stores. Oh, Shelley wants to correct me now. Oh, this is what happens when I trust you, Matt. Shelley, <laughs> why don't you tell us the story? Gap released a T-shirt that had a map of China on it. It wasn't a huge map; it was just like on the pocket, and it was、uh, not to be sold in China. But they apologized to the Chinese government for the fact that it didn't respect the sovereignty and territorial integrity. Of China, specifically because it left out Taiwan. Oops. And this is just the latest in a string of Western companies this year that have been forced to apologize, specifically for somehow regarding Taiwan as anything other than a historic part of China. It seems 2018 is the year of Chinese territorial sovereignty disputes, like. Well, no, we- that's been going on since 2014. It's just gotten very petty this year. Yeah, it's just we've seen it a lot more in the news, and we've seen more and more、uh, nine dash line related stuff, and we've definitely seen. For those of you who don't know, the nine dash line is、uh, basically how China makes a claim to the entire South China Sea, which six other countries claim. Am I right on that, Shelley? Depends、six. on whether you include Taiwan, but yes. Oh yeah, you're right. Five countries in one region. One province of China, perhaps. Taiwan region. Well, interestingly, Taiwan makes the same South China Sea claim as the People's Republic of China. But which one has built militarized islands? Well, if it's all one China, Shelley. Shelley, I feel like when you say militarized islands, it implies it's for military purposes. The Communist Party has been clear that those missile silos are purely for peaceful purposes.、Mm-hmm. Missiles for peace. Missiles for peace and scientific research. So anyway, the Chinese Communist Party has been pushing their territorial claims a lot this year, right? So you've got the Taiwan thing, which of course has been going on for for decades, but they've been pushing hard this year for that, and also the South China Sea claims, which we really saw almost. Almost none of those five six years ago. It was almost never an issue. Even you know when we started the show less than six years ago, there was hardly anything about the South China Sea. And now it seems、uh, they've just been pushing constantly, and the number of disputes have gone up a lot. Obviously, they they didn't even really start building anything on those shoals until about 2012, anyway. Well, basically, started off as a joke. They made the claim that they own all of the South China Sea, and everyone's like, "Okay, whatever." No one's really acting on that. But then they started to build fake islands、they're、in not, the South China Sea. They're not、uh-huh. fake, I would say. Like they're islands, but they they're man-made. They're artificially like sand dredged up onto the. Am I just being a killjoy right now? Because I feel like that's what's happening. No, no. I mean, you're technically accurate. So they're submerged features. Technically, in reefs, that、uh, then they dredged up a bunch of sand on to that destroyed the local ecosystem, but created fake islands. They、I、were mean, thinking out of the box, out of the sandbox. You beat me too, Matt. <laughs> I remember when we went to the Scarborough Shoal in the Philippines slash in China.、Uh, we we went there and it was kind of high tide and we were standing and it was about waist deep. Uh, on the sand, and there were like some rocks and coral that were sticking out above the waterline, but it was basically like you could stand, but you were、yeah. in water. Well, that's a, a feature that is disputed between the Philippines and China. That China has not been able to、uh, build up like they have with the other islands. So basically, what China did is they built these fake islands, Shelley. They built these fake islands, and then they started. Building on them and putting runways and then military armaments well, on them. Well, you know, also like restaurants and places because they're tourist destinations. Yeah, they're they're there for purely civilian reasons. Yeah, exactly. Civilians need missiles, and so now there's a situation where they've been pushing the envelope so much, and now it's like, okay, how do we stop them? 
they just keep doing it. And now they're challenging Western companies that, uh, uh, well, so some of the recent examples, uh, Shelley. Did you guys hear about what happened in that Australian city where they painted over a cow that had the Taiwanese flag on it? Really? It was uh, this Australian city where it's the Rockhampton Regional Council invited students to paint these like bull statues. Do you remember those like cow statues that were around a few years ago where they were painted in weird ways and like a lot of cities started to do things where they would have a lot of public art and they would paint statues of different animals. Mm. This one was bulls because they do a lot of beef in this Australian city. So they invited school kids to paint on the cow and one of them they had painted fishes with the different flags of like you know where the students were from and these two students painted the Taiwanese flag on a little fish and then they wrote the words Taiwan oh my gosh in Chinese on top were they trying to subvert state power well what happened was the Chinese vice consul wrote an angry letter to the mayor of this city in Australia. And then the city council painted over the Taiwanese flag Take fish. That, kids. <laughs> Vice consul, that sounds like a villain in Star Wars. Vice consul Moff. Oh, well, I can't carry on with that. I don't Star Wars <laughs> that well. Uh, that's ridiculous. Like, so I mean, this is what. I, I, I seriously cannot believe that those kids painted a Taiwan flag. Yeah, children are monsters. They have no sense of international diplomacy. But it's ridiculous this year how so it, it began with um, it began with Zara and Delta Airlines both having incidents where they portrayed Taiwan as if it were something other than a part of China. And it's actually happened to a lot of airlines. Oh, hmm. I was gonna say Mercedes Benz, but that was different because what they did was they the quoted Dalai the Dalai Lama. Lama. God, Mercedes. They'll never be the official car of official corruption like Audi, the way they go on. <laughs> they, they never quote the Dalai Lama. Yeah. So what happens with, uh, what's happened this year is a lot of airlines list uh, Taiwan under, it's as simple as they list Taiwan under a drop-down menu that says country. And so what happened recently was China sent 36 letters to these foreign company, foreign airlines complaining about it and like demanding apology and demanding them to change how they list Taiwan because Taiwan needs to be listed as, uh, well, what's acceptable now? Taiwan, China, Taiwan region, China. Those are some of the options. Yeah, like you can't just call it a region even anymore. It has to have region China. China yeah. yeah. And for the most part, all of these companies were like, oh, yes, we're, we're very sorry. Sorry, sorry, you know, sell out Taiwan, sorry, screw Taiwan. We got to you got please the Chinese Communist Party with this stupid one China well, policy. Well, I think what happened, the letter that the uh, Chinese government sent basically threatened to maybe take down their websites of these companies. Oh, do I need to? No, no. Oh, Ying's giving a look probably because Chris put down his glass. Is that what it was? Also, I could hear him drinking. Gold. <laughs> this is going into the podcast. This is like a BTS behind the scenes. Anyway, Shelly, what were you saying? Oh, it doesn't matter. You've been talking enough. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what, what was I saying? I don't remember anymore. I honestly haven't listened to a word yet. Okay. I think it was about... Taiwan. I think in Taiwan. Oh, so the Chinese government sent these letters that threatened to take down the websites of these airlines in China for mm -hmm. violating whatever rules by listing Taiwan as a region. And China potentially is going to be the world's largest air travel market by, I think, 2022. So that's a threat that airlines take seriously. Yeah. And I think one thing that I think is confusing is that the Chinese government has said to these airlines or these companies that you should align with your own government's one China policy, like meaning the US or Australia has a one China policy. Oh, but that's misleading. That, that is misleading. What is the US's one China policy, Chris? That they acknowledge that there is the one China policy, basically, but they don't really say which one is which, for the most part, right? I mean, they, rec they don't call the Taiwan embassy an embassy. But they don't say that the one China policy 
uh, as the Chinese Communist Party understands it is that there is one China and they are the real China. The U.S.'s version is just acknowledging that you guys believe that you're the one China, like, or, you know, that there's one China, you know. So Also, if they're saying the airlines should follow the U.S. government, does that mean these airlines should be supplying F-16 fighter jets to Taiwan? I would personally not use an F-16 fighter jet that came from, like, Southwest Airlines or something, but that's just me. But you know what's funny about the U.S.'s one China policy? It's like, we acknowledge that this is what you believe. But, like, that's also what I would say to, like, a crazy guy. It's like, I acknowledge that you believe that you're emperor of the moon. I mean, the moon is part of Chinese territory. We, that's been established in previous podcasts. Uh, that may end up being the case, yes. So what's weird is China has been threatening all of these companies and they've been caving in. And then uh, the Trump administration actually spoke up and was like, this is Orwellian nonsense. And yet shortly after uh, that statement was released, Gap immediately folds to this, the same thing. It's like, like they don't, they, like no one even considers for a moment that maybe we shouldn't uh, play along with this game. Well, just because the White House says we're going to stand up for you doesn't mean that the companies themselves believe it's, you know, worth the risk. You know, I, I think it takes more than just the White House saying, we've got your back if you stand up to the CCP. Like, I, I think that, that companies are just like, well, we still want to do business in China. And, you know, maybe they'll look back in a few years and realize how stupid they were. But at the moment, they're, they still feel that the political and economic pressure from the Communist Party is too much. I think also Gap is not selling that much in the U.S. anymore. Well, it's like IBM, the computers of Nazis. Wait, what? IBM was uh, worked with in Nazi Germany. And like that's kind of like a weird thing that like nobody likes to talk about anymore. Well, there are a lot of things that the Nazis did that people don't like to talk about. They had a huge influence on Hollywood. Really? I mean, Casablanca was great. No, there, there were some movie studios that wanted to uh, tone certain things down for the German market. Not so much during the war, but in the 30s. In the lead up. Hmm, interesting. Yeah. I mean, once the war started, then the U.S. turned to being, oh, the Nazis are evil. We've known this all along. But in like the mid 30s, late 30s, it was like, I mean, we want to reach the German market, right? So, you know, and obviously that's, it's just one of those things that, that companies like to do to make money and reach more people in the market. And they think more about the market than they do about what their content is. And uh, do you think this means in five to 10 years, we'll be seeing uh, comics with Wonder Woman punching Xi Jinping? Are, do they exist in the same universe? Wonder Woman and Xi Jinping? Yes. Well, like in the old days, Wonder Woman, like, pretty sure she punched Hitler. No, that was Captain America. I think they all punched Hitler. I mean, if you're making a comic, Wonder you have the Woman wasn't invented. Yeah, she was, she was old. Wonder Woman's old. Um... Yeah, was, Wonder Woman was like First World War. Um, and if the, in the DC Wonder Woman movie, that was a First I World think War that's... thing. That might just be the movie. All right. Uh, we need to look this up. Uh, podcast on pause. Anyway, let's move on. <laughs> Beautiful. Perfect transition. Moving on to another South China Sea and territorial uh. related thing. Hey, you know what T-shirt Gap should have made? The T-shirt that a group of Chinese tourists showed up wearing in an airport in Vietnam. What was so special about the t-shirt? Well, so their shirt had the map of China, plus Taiwan was included, plus it had the whole nine-dash line showing all, all of Chinese sounds, territorial claims. Sounds beautiful and elegant. Yeah, it was definitely hand-drawn. Uh, but so they actually got stopped at airport security, and the security was like, you, you should probably take that off because... Or you could get deported. Wasn't that the story? Well, so the, somebody at the airport took a photo of this group of Chinese tourists with this shirt. So it got out on uh, in the internet, internet in Vietnam anyways. So people were pissed off because Vietnam and China are in territorial disputes over the South China Sea. 
And so some people were like, oh, you, we need to immediately deport these people. I feel like that shirt was a little incomplete, though. I mean, didn't have... Antarctica. Didn't have the dark side of the moon. And it didn't have the Northwest Passage through the Arctic Circle, which is the shipping area. So, I mean, honestly, uh, it could have included a lot more. So it was quite a conservative shirt, in my view. Uh, actually, yeah, they, they should have been applauded for uh, their restraint. Yeah. Well, So there was a fan of China Uncensored that sent us a photo uh, that we re reposted on Facebook. And I believe it was a globe sold in Vietnam that had, you know, a standard map of the world. And it was made in China. Wait, wait, I'm confused. You, you said they had a globe? In their representation, the Earth wasn't flat. And I don't know. Sometimes they make these things called globes because to, per, to perpetuate the... Oh, the NASA lie. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> so, Can we just get through one podcast without talking every about pod, flat every, earthers? Every podcast. So the question about the flat Earth, can the Earth be flat and also be hollow? I assume so. But anyways, tell me about... Uh, so they were, sure. they were selling a globe, which was erroneous for right. at least two reasons. Okay. Because one of them was that it was a globe. We got it. We got it. Uh, number two, uh, this made in China globe had a map of China that included the whole nine dash line. Oh. And it was made in China? Yeah. Did it also explode? <laughs> and this was being sold in Vietnam? Yeah. Oh, wow. How about that? Yeah, we, we posted, um, a fan sent it to us, and I uh, reposted it on our China Uncensored Facebook page, like maybe last year. Mm. Well, so go dig around our old China Uncensored Facebook posts. We should make a t-shirt. Oh, sp speaking of t-shirts, Shelley, you had a great idea. Oh, yeah, because the Vietnam 9-line t-shirt was incomplete. I think we should make some t-shirts that have all of the Chinese territories on them. And when you say all the Chinese territories, what do you mean? Well, Antarctica and definitely the moon. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. All of the moon or just the dark side of the moon? I mean, what does the non-dark side of the moon belong to? Well, that's where the U.S. landed, but China is going to be trying to land on the dark side. Well, I think China... Will... But hold on, that doesn't matter. Where did Chang'e land? <laughs> Ooh, good point. Everywhere. That was her kingdom. So basically, the they're going to claim the entire moon, mm -hmm. except maybe a small circle around where the U.S. flag is from the Apollo mission. Yeah. Obviously, Mars, the red planet. Mm. That only makes sense. Only makes sense. So, yeah, so we, we should make those t-shirts. Well, yeah. I mean, let us know in the comments below whether you'd buy one of these Chinese territorial t-shirts. And if there's enough response, maybe we'll, uh, we'll make some. Here's something I'm, I'm confused about. So, I mean, the Earth is flat. But um, the, <laughs> the rest of the planets are round. Yeah, yeah, the, the rest of the planets are round, right? That's very interesting. That's a, I never thought it's, about it's that. It's an amazing universe we live in. It fills you with a sense of childlike wonder. <laughs> right, Shelley? That's what I'm feeling right now is childlike wonder. <laughs> <laughs> so since those Chinese tourists created such a big controversy, you know, Xi Jinping has been very adamant that uh, Chinese people behave abroad. This has even been a thing he's, he's spoken openly about, that uh, Chinese tourists need to, um, you know, fit in, fit in better, give Chinese people a good name. So since they didn't do so well, I, I wonder if that's going to lower their social credit score. The non-existent social credit score? Yes. I mean, we've seen in... A few different media in the last couple of weeks, uh, a lot Lower, about... last few years, really. Yeah, a lot about China's social credit score, and uh, Stephen Colbert did a, a funny thing about it. The idea that every citizen is going to get a score, ranking them for things like, you know, what they buy and their social media behavior. Or, you know, littering or just, what else, not paying loans back. There's like a variety of things that mm -hmm. have been proposed. But of course, a lot of these stories are getting some things completely and utterly wrong. And, uh, you know, we did a China Uncensored episode about it that came out on Monday. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's always portrayed like it's this, like, Orwellian nightmare that's, uh... yes, Shelley? Well, I think I'm not going to blame media for this too much because... I think the first time we reported on the social credit score. No, no, stop, stop, stop that, Shelley. Stop what? Good. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I get your point. It, it is a, 
it is a, a kind of a sexy story talking about this massive Orwellian system where Big Brother is watching you at all times and ranking you. But also, I think, you know, when we first saw stories about the social credit score, there hadn't been any yet. It was just a plan. So mm-hmm. it's hard to say that everybody's wrong when it's... Nobody knows anything. Yeah. About yeah. And back in 2014, they just announced that they were going... They The, the Chinese State Council released this outline of uh, a rough plan to develop this system between then and 2020. And so... Yeah, everyone's kind of freaking out that this is going to be this horrible uh, Orwellian system of everyone's getting a ranking. But what people always forget is China already is an Orwellian nightmare. It doesn't doesn't need anything new. But what's interesting about how the the Chinese Communist Party works is that they they often implement policies through the Chinese government. But you have the central government and you have local governments, and Unlike in the U.S., where something is often applied in a very standard way throughout the 50 states, in China, what happens is there's a kind of vague policy order from the very top, and then local officials are responsible for carrying out policy, but they're not necessarily given very specific instructions on how to do it. So they all come up with ways to meet the sort of target, but they might be done in very, very different ways. Yeah, it's both top-down and somehow bottom-up at the same time. Well, the best example of that is the toilet revolution. Do you remember when we talked about that? Basically, China had a reputation of having really nasty toilets. Oh, I can, it I can was attest not to a that. Re- it was not just a reputation. Oh, oh well, yeah. yeah. Here's, I, I here's stayed in some story. places, let me tell you. I won't tell you, but it was bad. Uh, and I stayed in, I mean, I was a tourist, so I didn't see what it was like in the most horrible rural areas. Uh, Shelly, who who was from China. I'm sorry. Are you implying that I grew up in the most horrible rural areas? Uh, like Pittsburgh. <laughs> oh. hey, I love Pittsburgh. I, and I love fans okay, from Pittsburgh. Okay, go Steelers. Yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm a Niners. <laughs> I mean, you lived in China until you were like three or four. And then you went back to visit in the late 90s. Yes. I don't enjoy squat toilets. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, until or, the Olympics, China I mean, still had mostly squat toilets. Well, I, I, I could think you I could, tell your experience in uh, We could in tell. We could swap yeah. toilet story. You tell one, then I'll tell one. So so here's the here's the context. China has a reputation for bad toilets. Explain that. So and I was traveling chi- in China and this was 2002. I was in Yunnan province, which is in the south, and I was staying in this this small town called Zhongjian, and they had like only one hostel, and the bathrooms were basically, and this is all tourists, you know, so this was like done nicely, and it was just this row of holes separated by walls. But the walls were only maybe two, two and a half feet high. And the fronts were completely open. And the fronts were open and faced the open showers. Mm. So it was just, you're sitting there and people come to take a shower. It's just awkward for so many reasons. Uh, And like at least those were clean, right? And I went to some places that were like that. Oh, so I was in this one place. I was in a, a public bathroom in also in Yunnan province. And, you know, it was the middle of the day. I really needed to use the bathroom. It was completely empty. There were just eight holes on a raised platform separated by nothing. And I sit all the way in the corner. So I'm sitting there and this old Chinese man comes in and I'm thinking to myself, oh no. And he comes in, he squats at the hole right next to mine. And I'm feeling super awkward. And he looks at me, probably realizes that I'm feeling awkward. So he does what any Chinese man would do and offers me a cigarette. That's a touching story of uh, two cultures meeting and uh, really making breakthroughs. You know, connecting over your shared humanity. That's right. That's Wow. There's your childlike wonder, Shelley. Mm. Do you have any uh, stories like that? Mm. All right. My toilet story is from 1997 when I went to China and we went to my mother's clan village. You're really getting to know us, by the way. Yes. So 
she had a uh, aunt and uncle who still lived in this village where, and we're talking like dirt roads. Um, people would put their wheat on the ground so that c- when cars drove over it, it would like shell the wheat uh, grains for Sounds. them. Yeah, and uh, there was really spotty electricity, and uh, I had to use the bathroom while we were there. And so I go into the outhouse, which, of course, you have. You don't have, like, an indoor flushing toilet. It's an outhouse. And, like, you know, I turn around. It's a, uh, with a, uh, like, dirt hole in the dirt. And I look in, and there is a snout sticking what? out of the hole. And it's like a pig snout. A pig snout is sticking out of the hole. <laughs> and I... Alf? S- yeah, okay. It's Alf. <laughs> <laughs> That's where he's been this whole time. <laughs> we, we hijacked your story. So, so you're, you're in a toilet and there's a, there's a pig snout. <laughs> or an Alf snout. <laughs> or an Alf snout. We don't know. Shelly hasn't finished the story. Don't you think you've been talking too much? Then I threw a cat in there because it was Alf. (laughs) Please continue. I feel like what's the point now? Where did you get the cat, Shelly? My my grandparents were here. I have it for dinner that night. Oh, oh, this took a dark turn. Wait, did you? No, we don't eat cats. No, the, the the pig. No, okay, it was a... So I look down, there's a pig snout sticking mm. out of the hole, and I scream and run out of the outhouse, and then my great aunt and uncle are like, "What? what's the deal? It's, yeah, they their outhouse, very naturally, there's like a little... The hole has a little ramp so that, you know, the uh, effluvia can just slide down wow. into the pig trough that's, you know, dug into the front of the yard. Can we give Shelly a round of applause for that? Uh, <laughs> somebody did well on her SATs. What was your score? Verbal 800. Oh, that was in the days when 800 was the highest score. I think it's back to that now. Is it? I yeah. mean, for verbal and math, I think they've gone back. Oh, okay. Well, At, at any rate, so these kinds of stories really should not be allowed to take place uh, anymore in China. And that's why Xi Jinping uh, and other top central government officials wanted to kind of have this toilet revolution, right? And they basically told officials, hey, you know, you've got to clean up your act. You've got to make the the toilets tourist safe. And this has kind of been happening since China was preparing for the 2008 Olympics. Mm -hmm. But, you know, things kind of happened gradually. So... I mean, toilets across China, from what I hear, are much, much better now. I haven't been back to mainland China in a while. I'm sure they'd love to have us. Yeah. I mean, honestly, Chris, you're one of the main reasons why I can't go back to China. Oh, you're welcome. Let's, let's definitely blame it all on Chris. Yeah. I think so. Yeah. Uh, but so, anyways. We got a little sidetracked. We got a little, we got a little sidetracked, guys, but we're okay. But so this is why, so there was this initiative to, cl- to make the toilets nicer. But then you had examples of local officials having just had the vague directive of make toilets nicer, spending, uh, like, what, tens of thousands of dollars? Like, like making one really nice toilet. I mean, because you really all you want is one single nice toilet what were some of the things like facial, facial recognition, recognition uh internet i think there were some places that had refrigerators and microwaves because that's what i want in my toilet oh absolutely and so, so that's really the best example of just like a top-down initiative just going completely bonkers the worst part was is you know alf had nothing to eat anymore <laughs> well i think the thing about like the top down directives is because often these directives are actually tied to promotions for local officials. So mm-hmm. like people kind of you don't and you don't know exactly what the measuring standards are. So some people kind of t- go a little too far mm-hmm. in their eagerness to be promoted. Like w- another example that's a little less funny than the toilet thing was this winter in Hubei they were supposed to be transitioning from coal right like 
to natural gas. So like these uh, areas, like rural areas, they were supposed to like be destroying like their coal burning stoves and yeah. installing top down initiative. Yes, less coal, more natural gas. So uh, some of the areas tried to like outdo the numbers that they were supposed to meet. So they basically destroyed all these coal stoves from, from these people's houses, and they didn't have enough time to install all the natural gas stoves, and they also ran out of natural gas. And that is much worse than building toilets that are too nice. Yeah, And people actually died because of that. Like, people, you know, f- froze to death, or yeah. had to, like, go forage for sticks to burn in the woods. Like, it was bad. And you hear these kind of stories back in the, you know, Cultural Revolution, or the Great Leap Forward, where, you know, people... Uh, had to be devoting all their time to making, uh, what was it, steel? Oh, yes. Iron. Steel. Yeah, and so people were starving to death because... It was actually the Great Leap Forward. What did I say? Cultural Revolution, right? I said Cultural Revolution. And then he corrected okay. himself. Yeah. Um, start over, sorry. No, we don't have to start over. This is all good. This is this is huh. how, we, how we work things over. But yeah, it's just, it's this is where the structure of the government... Um, results in just people dying for really stupid reasons that would not happen if there was even just a little bit of freedom. Right, because as a lower level official, the only thing that's politically safe to do is meet these targets. Even if you have to do the most outrageous things to achieve them, you're not held accountable for all the things that you have to do to meet the targets well, as long as you meet the targets. Well, that's not entirely true because this is this is why being like a lower level Chinese official is so difficult. You get a directive and then you have no idea what to do. If you if you do too little, you'll be punished and purged. If you do too much, you'll be punished and purged. So it's this so really, you've got to do the Goldilocks of. Well, what whatever you, the goalie looks basically but uh, the situation now is just a lot of Chinese officials just do nothing because they don't know which way to go especially when it's so apparent that there is a you know a, a political battle for power at the top levels of central government nobody wants to really do anything they just kind of want to ride out the storm and see what happens yeah and uh, I think you know all of this sort of reflects in how the social credit system is working. And I just want to point out how we initially were talking about the social credit system and somehow it made its way to pig toilets. And now we're back That's to- That's the beauty of a podcast, Matt. Yeah, we a, were providing a, a wonderful pastiche. So, and, and the pig toilets really, I think, is the most entertaining part of the whole podcast. Yeah, except uh, you decided to step all over my punchline. Well, I mean, then it took us to Alf. <laughs> Okay. Which I mean, really, we need. That to was have a good Alf show. Back in Alf the was lives. a good show. So anyway, we're talking about the uh, social credit score system, and so, you know, we talked about this. You have these top-down initiatives, and then local officials are responsible for figuring out how to implement them. So you've seen like these radically different ways of doing it, from cities like Shanghai doing it through this app on, on people's smartphones, to a city in. Shandong province where their like, system made the best sense it was like a, it was, a it was, live it was, sim game but you're oh, like writing like Harry on Potter paper. houses where you yeah. can like yeah. get points or lose points yeah. yeah boy the Hogwarts sure must have been uh, tied to the central government was that the right joke to make yeah <sighs> so yeah they had the that city had the Hogwarts system and then you had like this this rural village that was having people write down things on uh, paper like, like pen, and, pen and paper, like, like people keeping... Like the gold keeping, star system. It was like, a, yeah, a red yeah. star system, oh, though, because yes. it's China. Yes. Obviously. Okay. Yeah, you, you'd get points if you were, uh, you know, most productive or most uh, had the most filial piety, which, I mean... Good I mean, that's what I was voted in high school, most filial piety. Actually, you know what I was really voted in high school, and this is 100% real. What? I was voted most serious. I don't believe that for a second. You I must had... have been so different in high school. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> and then I went on to work on a comedy news show. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Um, so I, I, no one even voted for me. I, I was like but like, ghost. what kind of category is most serious? Um, it's the most serious category. Mm. Yeah. Oh God. That's where we need the the. Ba-dum-sh. So anyway, so the social credit system. Social credit. You've system. got this toward totally different style of implementation across China, 
some cities are taking it really seriously, some hardly at all. And there's no way to merge these systems. Well, mm-hmm. they've got until 2020, so. Yeah, plenty of Yeah, they have like a year and a half. No well, problem. actually. Or the end of 20, so two and a half years, maybe. Technically, they don't have to do anything by 2020. That's also. One of like, the misconceptions. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And then there's also uh, like the eight private companies doing it as well, which, and the most uh, uh, established is Ant Financial's Sesame Credit, Ant Financial being a subsidiary of uh, Alibaba. Yeah, just, that's why it's Sesame Credit, because it's Alibaba. I just got that now. Really? Oh, my God. <laughs> of course. <laughs> Open Sesame. Yes. Wow, that is so... Jack Ma is so clever. Wow, this is like real time. Oh Chris's mind is being blown. <laughs> Whoa. Oh, man. That yeah, I, I totally knew that the yeah. whole time. Yeah. So, but I mean, Sesame Credit is kind of like, you well, know... So we've read some interesting uh, analysis... Analysi? Analysi? Analyses? Come on, 800. Analyses. Analyses. About that, uh, that says, rather than being like this horrible totalitarian system, like, the Sesame Credit is more about encouraging people to buy stuff. Yeah, I guess you could say, if you were to compare it to anything, it would be more like your credit score in like your financial credit score that, that we have in America where like credit cards and like yeah. like opening credit cards that kind of stuff it affects your seems credit score more like these mobile phone games people play where if you want to level up you have to spend real cash Yeah, I mean I think Sesame Credit what what it t- kind of was originally supposed to be was like about like people's financial social health but mm. now it's kind of becoming like if that. you buy luxury products, well, yeah. you must be a contributing member of society, so therefore you get more points. Yes, I mean, like it gets you weird benefits, like you can travel without a visa to Luxembourg. Where you can use your Alipay app to look up local sites and make more purchases. So it'd be like if, uh, you know, TripAdvisor worked with the U.S. government to give you... so awesome. Really? Yeah. But I mean, this is what happens. Like when you, whichever type of organization you have to create a system, like it's going to be incentivized along the lines of whatever that company does, right? So if you have a a company that sells stuff, make a social credit system, it's going to be designed to have you buy more stuff. If you have a social credit system that's designed by a local government, their incentives might be to stop people from petitioning Mm. And or if you have a t-shirt designed by The Gap, you have it uh, so it includes Taiwan. Well, that's what they should have done. But I think we should talk about what the ultimate purpose of the social credit system. The purpose or why it's not as, as scary as it? Well, I think, I think it, the current implementation is not scary. I suppose there's... So but people, you don't know what it's going to become. You know what I mean? Yeah, that is where it's scary, where you don't know really what the ultimate goal of this is. Well, and essentially, the Communist Party is trying to, like any other organization around the world, trying to figure out what to do with all of this data that is being created by people in the digital era. Um, but one thing people get wrong about all of the different uh, social credit systems in China is it is not right now the super scary thing everything else around it is already super scary i mean you can already be blacklisted you don't need a social credit score there are some places where we've seen the stories about somebody not being able to like get on a train or something but like that's not because they had a low score it's because they were blacklisted for some other reason yeah and a lot of the information is already being pulled from government data sources so all that information the government already has you're already being monitored by the vast system of surveillance in China. Yeah, pretty much all the big cities have now uh, face recognition technology linked to cameras. And so each police district has like access to this and they can track an individual's movements throughout anywhere in the city where there's surveillance cameras. I think, though, that also depends on how... That is, again, one of those things that's not implemented everywhere yet. Yet, mm-hmm. Yeah, but certainly in like the big cities, they've got this, this technology because they put a high priority on being able to track people. And in Xinjiang, they're collecting the DNA of the people, the Uyghurs there. So- yeah, I mean, the thing about Xinjiang is it's often used as the 
like experimentation yes the laboratory of Ooh. like chinese surveillance apparatuses so, so yeah. basically without the social credit system it's already horrifying they've already out orwell george orwell i think the social credit system is actually a way of trying to spin some of these surveillance things as being a positive like we can use your social credit score to determine who's trustworthy in society like so people know right We're making sure people aren't littering or jaywalking or you know we'll we can determine who is a trustworthy person or not based on their social credit score which on one hand sounds like yeah in, especially in a place like China where uh, you see these stories about like um, people who don't want to stop and help people who've been hit by cars or something because they're afraid of being sued by the person who Which happens. yeah so like there there's a lack of good samaritan laws there's like a lot of worry uh, about you know people's morality in certain ways like what kind of uh, society are we becoming if people are too afraid to help someone in need mm-hmm. right so I think the social credit score is in a way trying to address those concerns but it's also creepy because do you really want the Chinese government the Chinese Communist Party to be the one to determine who's trustworthy or not well, they're already trying to put themselves above uh, the Catholic Church and all other religions in China. So is that a yes or no? Um, no. What was the question? <laughs> Should the Communist Party be the one to determine who's trustworthy? Uh, I mean, I, I think the real question is, how, how do you think ALF is going to fare under the social credit system? Depends on whether eating cats is considered positive or negative. Was there ever a campaign against cats? Like eating cats? Chairman Meow. I think, you know, <laughs> it doesn't matter if it's a black cat or a white cat. As long oh, as it yeah. catches mice, it's a good cat. Or Shelley a delicious just, cat. Shelly just quoted an acropophal? Ap- acro- <laughs> apocryphal? Apocryphal uh, <laughs> quote of Deng Xiaoping to... Uh, justify his uh, economic reforms of China. Well, you think he didn't really say it? I mean, it's one of those things where there's no evidence that he actually Mm -hmm. said it, but it's attributed to him. Just like it's being constantly attributed to Lao Tzu that, um, you know, if you love what you do, you never work a day in your life. Oh, that was Confucius. I've seen it. It's misattributed to everyone, like both of them. They, they they definitely both cared a lot about that particular issue. Yes, absolutely. Or let's let's all have a glass of whiskey and a good steak, Mahatma Gandhi. I did not know where you were gonna go with that. Yeah. yeah. Wow, you just really kind of stuck your snout in that or something. Yeah. <laughs> oh. oh. I think I think. One of our sound people has just hung themselves. <laughs> um, so anyway. Which one would that be? <clears throat> so anyway, the, the social credit... <clears throat> Change, by the way. So, um, so anyway, uh, the social credit system... Hanged. Hanged, really? Yeah. Hung, hanged? Hanged. Mm-hmm. What about a hung jury? She, she, hung. she hung a painting. He hanged himself. Got, got hanged. I like my folksy kind of way of speaking. I think that'll get me elected. What do you think? Chris Chappell, 2020 president i'm not asking you to i'm asking the audience i that's going to be way out of context for them no are we going to have all, no are we going to have the stuff about hung hanged in there maybe <laughs> <laughs> if we're going to have the part about alf uh, okay yeah. verbal, i think the theme of today's episode is um high verbal scores <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were going to say verbal diarrhea and therefore bring it back around to the toilet revolution. Verbal diarrhea, toilet revolution. That's very good, Shelley. Mm-hmm. You're very smart, as our acting teacher always likes to say. It's because I'm Chinese. That's also what he likes to say. And I ignore <laughs> the mildly racist connotation. I mean, it's that. easier to ignore when it's positive, right? <laughs> Uh, mm. uh, 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 we need a new topic <laughs> Shelly, save us Save us, please You're not saving us, Shelly
Are we done? I we're not we, done. We're done at Alf. No. We we. Well, there's one topic we can talk about, which is the Malaysia elections, which happened recently. And hey, Shelley, I'm so disappointed that you didn't save us. I knew Matt was going to jump in. Because he always jumps in, like when I was about to reach the high point of my story. Oh, oh, that's not gonna go. (laughs) So, at any rate, there are these elections in Malaysia, and one of the things that was driving votes uh, is that people were unhappy about a lot of Chinese money coming in from Chinese state-owned companies and the Chinese nouveau riche coming in and, and buying up property in Malaysia. Sounds and, it's kind of and, like you're, you're, you're minding your own business and suddenly there's Alf snout right there, right? Is that a metaphor? That's sort of appropriate. At, at any rate, you know, Malaysia has had Chinese people since, <laughs> at least since the 19th century, if and not further back. very smart, right, Shelley? Oh, yes, very smart. Uh, and they're, they're roughly a quarter of Malaysia's population. But, but, these people are, you know, they're ethnically Chinese and uh, they're part of the Malaysian, f- uh, you know, fabric of society. I, so yes, what's, although there is, there has always historically been some tension there. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, That's, is that there's a growing amount of uh, anti-Chinese sentiment in Southeast Asia, a lot because of the territorial disputes that right. end up on shirts. And so, and so what's happening is that you've got these people who've lived in Malaysia for generations and problems that are now being caused by uh, waves of uh, Chinese money coming in you know, externally, essentially. So like you've got this development, for example, called Forest City, which is in Malaysia, it's basically like, you know, a mile or two from Singapore, right? Because Singapore is right off the tip of the Malaysian Peninsula. And uh, this forest city, they're calling it, and, you know, most of the properties have been bought up by, not by Malaysians or Malaysian Chinese, but by mainland Chinese people who are just coming in with this money. And China now has so many millionaires. Uh, There's just so much money. People want to invest it. They want to buy real estate. So you've got... You've got this tension, and then you've got you know Chinese state-owned companies coming in, and they want to make Malaysia part of the One Belt One Road initiative, and so the the guy who was just voted in to be the new prime minister, um, Mahathir Mohammed is his name, and part of his campaign uh, was focused on okay, we're going to review some of these Chinese investments and make sure this is really what our country needs. And what's interesting about this is that it's happening in Malaysia, but it could happen in a lot of other countries because a lot of other countries are starting to see waves and waves of Chinese money coming in with locals being increasingly unhappy. And so are we going to start to see uh, a sort of anti-Chinese sentiment in different countries? That was, that was so long, I think hell, uh, Shelley hung herself. Hung. Hanged. No, wait, in that case it's hanged? Oh, God, I hate this language. <laughs> it's betrayed me so many times. You know, I, I gotta say Chinese makes a lot more sense. Mm-hmm. Like, oh. really, like, Chinese is so, like, practical. No, no future tense or past tense. But also a lot of Everyone's things. just tense all the time. Uh, all right. Social so, credit system? Okay, no, that I, was a bad joke. So I wait, I, wait. So how many points do you lose for interrupting people? Oh, Alf, we brought it back. Oh, man. You just did it to me again. Again. <laughs> oh, this is... So just so you guys know... No? Okay. Never mind. You'll never know what I was about to say. I guess you could call it a hanged jury, right? <laughs> uh, uh, okay, let's go back to Malaysia. Oh, yeah. Hey, uh, so I missed all of that. Malaysia. Do you want me to try to say it again in a more succinct way? <laughs> no, no, no. I, I think maybe what is interesting about the Malaysian thing is that there was a lot of unhappiness with the previous government and the previous prime minister for these deals with the Chinese government over One Belt, One Road. I think there definitely is some tension with the Chinese investors coming in, but what 
people were upset with the government for was, first of all, a lot of government corruption, and then feeling like they're going to be paying back this debt to the Chinese government. A debt trap. Yes. A favorite tactic of the Chinese Communist Party. So Malaysia, it's interesting, too, because Malaysia, several years ago, was one of the first countries in Southeast Asia to kind of, uh, specifically in the ASEAN nations, to specifically turn a more friendly eye to uh, the Chinese government for because of their financial help. Like, mm-hmm. they did things like uh, block, you know, resolutions in ASEAN about the South China Sea, or uh, was it Malaysia that repatriated a bunch of Uyghurs to China? Do you remember this? Oh, I remember that. Was it Malaysia? Or was it Indonesia or something? Let me quickly fact check that. We can. Oh, we have to wait and let it out. Shelly always trying to be accurate. What was the theme song to Alf? Everywhere there's Alf. Everywhere (laughs) there's Alf. (laughs) And Alf needs you. Oh, this is great. Yeah, they did. So we can just, you can just be like, yes. I mean, then we'd miss the Alf song. <laughs> that could yes. just be at the end. Yes. Yes, it was Malaysia. So, yeah, Malaysia was one of the first countries in Southeast Asia to get really friendly with the Communist Party of China, and now it looks like there may be a little regret. Mm-hmm. And there are, this is happening all throughout Southeast Asia. Oh, there's a, periodically there'll be anti Chinese riots that happen. And it's kind of a shame to see that, like, the decisions the Chinese Communist Party make that are so horrible are negatively affecting Chinese people. And then when people react against that, the Communist Party is like, oh, look at all these people being racist against Chinese people. We need to be united. Yeah. Yeah. Stick a snout in that. It's almost like the Communist Party is using overseas... Chinese as pawns in their political game. Anyway, so I I think people in Malaysia, you know, they look at what's happened in Sri Lanka and Pakistan and Djibouti. They're paying close attention to Djibouti. They are As we all are. Uh, Especially Shelly. So so they're they're paying attention to this and they don't want that kind of debt trap to happen to them. And uh, it's so inviting to have this Chinese money. But I think, you know, Malaysia is uh, certainly the voters turned out in force to uh, say no to the previous Malaysian administration. And granted, it was for reasons besides just China related stuff. I mean, Prime Minister Rajit was also like super corrupt and and perhaps stole like more than half a billion dollars of public money. But oh, is that all? Yeah, I mean, that's that's a little bit of cash. So Shelley, Please don't interrupt Matt when he's talking. That's very rude. Very rude. I know, Shelly. I, let me apologize for Shelly, everyone. Oh, it's all my fault. <laughs> I uh, hog the conversation. Oh, I alf the conversation. <laughs> <sighs> okay, the, the thumbnail for this episode really has to have alf in it, doesn't it? Maybe Alf with like good SAT score <laughs> covered all all the important topics. Uh, so let's move on to the last topic of today's podcast, which is where we are going uh, next week, which is Norway. I feel like you just kind of seize control of the podcast, man. And like, uh, I just uh, we need to resolutely purge you. I know I'm being a bit pig-headed about this. It doesn't work when you do it. <laughs> Yeah, so we're going to Norway. We were invited to, uh, well, I say we because I'm a very generous person. Rather, I was invited to uh, uh, be on a panel discussion at the Oslo Freedom Forum. We're talking about the dark side of tech. I know, I didn't think there was one either, but uh, apparently the Chinese Communist Party, as we mentioned with the social credit, might be using technology for some pretty nefarious purposes. And I happen to love Norway. Really? Yeah, I actually was in Norway, uh, gosh, 
basically ten years ago, I went on a. Oh, this is this is going to be a nice story. Yeah, I, I went uh, basically ten years ago uh, with my college. I was in the college. I was in the university choir, so we went on a singing tour of Scandinavia. What did you sing? Um. Well, we obviously sang some Grieg. Okay. You're looking. You're looking at me blank. Shot. You don't know Grieg. No. You have a verbal score of eight hundred, but you don't know the single greatest uh, Norwegian composer oh, ever. Oh. Okay. We're this like is the why. Only Norwegian composer ever. Pipe down back there. <laughs> There's loads of good ones. I just don't have the time on this podcast to list all the other ones besides Greek. We went to his tomb. He was very short. Very short. Anyways, I love being in uh, Norway. I, we, we, we landed in this town uh, called Bergen on uh, their Independence Day. Sutnamai, they call it, when they liberated themselves from those horrible Swedes. And... <laughs> I, it was great. Like the whole town was was really. You know, I have to say so that Matt and I appreciate our Swedish fans. Uh, well, I I do as well. I just think uh, Sweden did some not okay things in the past, and they should apologize for it. But yeah, it, it, you you guys haven't been to Norway. No, I've never been. Yeah. I dated a Norwegian guy. Does that count? Oh, Shell, you're always talking about that Norwegian guy. <laughs> so How was it dating a Norwegian guy? Um, Did he interrupt your conversations with Alf? No, weirdly. I don't think he knew what Alf was. <laughs> Clearly not the right choice. No, no, I'm glad I dumped him. Yeah. Uh, the cool thing is, uh, because of where Norway is located, I think we're going to like probably a like twenty hour day. It's amazing how long the daytime is at this time of year. Well, it is actually going to be seventeen hours and thirty minutes of daylight right now. Seventeen hours of daylight. That's that's, that's amazing. It is so amazing how a country so high up on the Earth disk can have such wildly different times. <laughs> Way to bring it back, Chris. Thank you. Always coming back to uh, where we're at. To the flat oh, Earth. Love, 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 love. So, uh, so yeah, we're gonna we're gonna be meeting up with a bunch of people who have been involved in human rights issues. Uh, you know, in, in different respects, not just China, of course, but around the world. Yeah, we should have some but, fun interviews that we'll hopefully be releasing uh, when we get back. And yeah. uh, best fish and chips I've ever had, Norway. Well, this is going to be uh, an exciting trip. We sh- we have to eat at Domino's. No, shall I? <laughs> we have learned our lesson from Australia. No McDonald's. Well, actually, I wonder what kind of special Norwegian cuisine they have at McDonald's. Like a like a fish pie. Fermented fish, fermented fish pie. Oh, Big I, I hope they don't have that. Uh, that fermented shark, like in Iceland, that's that was the certainly the most interesting thing I've ever eaten. But surely you did not eat shark because it'd be ridiculous to say on a podcast that you ate shark, right, Matt? I would never eat a shark's fin, but the shark itself is that okay? Those poor sharks, they're a monster. I don't know if that's controversial. Anyway, let's let's just let's just cut that part and. Uh, and wrap it up. Just like you cut that part off of that shark. <laughs> what do you guys think of Matt eating shark? Leave your comments below. <laughs> no, Thanks for listening stop. to this episode of China Unscripted. <laughs> See you next time. Official end of the episode. We're done. Bye. <laughs> God, that's my favorite end of the episode so far. <laughs> <laughs>